welcome back beloved today's video is going to be pretty short it's just kind of like a devotional little prophecy i came across this morning i wanted to share with you guys and so the title is jacob tended sheep for a wife that's an old testament bible verse in jose i'll pull it up in a minute but you can clearly see this is a foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's two types of prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. One are direct predictions. For example, Isaiah chapter 53, written 700 years before Jesus. He was pierced for our transgressions. But then there's also tens, dozens, maybe hundreds of foreshadowings. When Moses lifts up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, that's a type of Christ. When Isaac carries the wood, right? This is written down 1,500 years before Jesus is born. When Isaac carries the wood up Mount Moriah to sacrifice, right? That's like Jesus carrying the wood of his cross for his sacrifice. So there's many foreshadowings revealed in Scripture, and then we get to dig in and find, you know, a couple of our own that I think are, are pretty clear. And so I made another video a while back. It's only 20 minutes on Genesis 32. You've got to understand, you know, Jacob is a patriarch, right? There's, there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're all, you know, their lives are all cataloged in the book of Genesis, written 1,500 years before Jesus is born. This video breaks down Genesis 32, where Jacob literally wrestles with a man all night, and then he says, I've seen the Lord. So he wrestled with a God man, right? A man who he realized was God. And so it was a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's many of those in scripture uh, pointing towards, you know, uh, the God man coming, Emmanuel, God with us. So Jacob's already a clear, you know, foreshadowing. Here's another one, though, that I hadn't realized until now. So in Hosea chapter 12, this is about 700 years before Jesus is born. It says, Jacob fled to the country of Syria, which he did. He did. And then it says, Israel served for a spouse. So uh, Jacob is Israel, right? That's his name. It was changed. Jacob became Israel. So Jacob served for his wife. And for a wife, it says, he tended sheep. He was a shepherd and he shepherded his sheep for a wife. And it's amazing when you get this parallel. And I believe the Holy Spirit opens up our eyes to these things. So here is Jacob, a patriarch. He serves seven years and then Laban deceives him and he gives him a, a wife named Leah. But he doesn't want Leah. He wants Rachel. So he has to serve another seven years for Rachel. But the bottom line is Jacob works hard tending sheep for a spouse, for his wife. You can see the clear foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Genesis 29, Jacob served seven years for Rachel. That's the wife who he loved. And they seemed only a few days to him. It was worth it because of the love he had for her. Guys, if this is how Jacob loved Rachel, that means Jesus loves his bride, the church, infinitely more than this. I mean, it really is kind of beautiful. And the New Testament brings this to life. Jacob served. Jesus serves, right? And Jacob was serving for a wife. Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 10. The son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom, a payment for many. And so Jesus, you know, all the Old Testament is pointing towards Jesus in such a beautiful way. You get all the physical concepts like, you know, uh, of, of greater spiritual, you know, realities that are revealed in the New Testament. Like the manna physically came down while, while the Israelites are walking through the desert and they ate the bread from heaven. And then Jesus says, yes, bread right now, temporarily, that's great. That'll feed your belly. I'm the bread of life that came down from heaven. I give eternal life. This is the spiritual counterparts to all these physical realities. So Jacob served for a wife. Jesus served for his spouse, the church. Jesus tended sheep. It says in John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd. These are, the, I think, some of the most comforting verses in the Bible for Christians. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. It goes on to say, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I am known by my own. We are his sheep. It goes on to say, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life. It is a free gift for the sheep. 
My sheep hear my voice. I use this all the time in evangelism. It's beautiful. Jesus's voice are the words of God, right? Old Testament and New Testament, the very words of God are his voice, right? The, the only way we know who Jesus is is through scripture. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. And Jesus even had to work for us. It's beautiful. I mean, it's amazing. He does it for God's glory, but certainly for our benefit. And and what's amazing about this is Jacob worked for seven years and then he was deceived and didn't get the wife he wanted. He had to work seven years again, right? It says Jesus despised the shame of what he had to do. He didn't enjoy it. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, we look unto Jesus, the author, the originator, the one who started and the finisher of our faith. He not only gave us faith, but he sustains and preserves that faith. And it says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Look back to Genesis 29, 20. Jacob served for seven years for Rachel, but they seemed only a few days to him. He didn't enjoy the work because it was the love that he had for her. It's the same thing. Okay. It says in Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising. Hey, he hated the shame. Jesus Christ is God. He's the son of God, the Holy One of Israel. For him to die naked on a cross, he despised that, but he did it for the joy that was set before him. And now he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did he do this, all this shame? Well, first of all, for God's glory but certainly for our benefit. Ephesians 5, chapter 25, it's a, uh, verse 25, it talks about husbands. It's so convicting. It says, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And this is why he did it, that he might sanctify, set apart the church, cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, right? And that's how we get cleaned up. It's by the word, the gospel. And then to continue in that sanctification, we desire the pure milk of the word. And it's like a daily washing over us that he might present to himself. This is beautiful. He might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, just like those sacrificial lambs. The church will be brought to glory and Almighty God will, with, with, with his eyes of flaming fire, stare at his bride and he will not find one flaw or any such thing. We will be holy and without blemish. Not because we're good. G Paul said, in me and my flesh is nothing good, but because Christ is good. He literally bore our sins on the cross. Literally, uh, you know, the sins, the filth that we've done, he bore that on the cross and then he gave us his righteousness. We're literally robed in his righteousness for all eternity. So it is for God's glory, the glory of his righteousness, his grace, his mercy, his love, but whew, <laughs> it is also for our good. And I just praise God for that. So Jacob tended sheep for a wife and Jesus is the one who ultimately tended sheep for a wife.